What have we got today? All right, we've got Messier 5 today, or NGC 5904. Here it is. As you see, it's a massive globular cluster. That's nice. It's absolutely full of stars. Some people think there's about 100,000 to 500,000 stars in this globular cluster alone. It's about 13 billion years old. So we're talking right near the start of the universe this has been around for. It's also 165 light years across, which is massive. So if you think about the Milky Way itself is about 100,000 light years across, and this is 165. So I worked out it's about 0.1 of a percent of the entire Milky Way, which considering this is just one object, like is, is huge, right? <laughs> like it's massive. So the good thing that about the fact that it's so big is that it has a lot of rare stars in it as well. So it has about a hundred what's called RR Lyrae stars, which are super variable stars, and they are variable, very regular. Their period of variability is related to their luminosity. So you can use them to measure distance, which is what I was gonna talk about until I found a paper talking about this that uses M5 as a particle physics laboratory. Yeah, I was like, what? <laughs> These crazy particle physicists doing now. <laughs> What's this? Is this the paper here? Yeah, this is the paper. So particle physics constraints from the globular cluster M5. So they are trying to measure this neutrino dipole moment. It's a magnetic dipole moment. Neutrinos form as part of the standard model of particle physics, this idea that you know they know all the particles and this is the model that you have. Okay, so protons, electrons, quarks, all this stuff. Neutrinos, okay? Neutrinos are absolutely tiny. Like, the tiniest mass. They're about a million times smaller than an electron. Okay, so we're talking incredibly small. The only reason that we even knew they existed was because in radioactive decay reactions, you sort of, if you balance the two sides of the equation about what you started with and what you decayed into, it wasn't quite balanced right. It was always a tiny amount of energy that was sort of missing on the decay side. And people thought, you know, it could be an error in the calculations until they realised actually it's another particle, it's just absolutely tiny. And so this happens in the sun where you get these radioactive decays into neutrinos. And so the sun is producing a ridiculous amount of neutrinos all the time. So if I just hold my thumb up, 65 million neutrinos just pass through my thumb. Oh, are you okay? Yeah. <laughs> well, that's the thing, they don't interact at all. So what do they mean by magnetic dipole? Okay, so a magnetic dipole is basically just a bar magnet. You know, you have something with a north end and a south end. Thing is, particles can also be magnetic dipoles. So despite the fact that, say, an electron or a neutrino doesn't really have north and south poles like a bar magnet does, because it has this weird quantum property called spin, um, because it has charge, it also has a magnetic dipole. The moment basically means the force that if you put that magnetic dipole in another magnetic field, the force that that particle would feel in that magnetic field. So what they're basically trying to do is measure what's the magnetic dipole moment of the neutrinos by seeing how they behave in the magnetic field of the stars in the globular cluster of M5. What happens is in stellar lifetimes, okay, you have normal stars that just happily burn hydrogen all the time on what we call the main sequence. You know, that sort of related their colour and their brightness in this sort of really tight sequence. When they start to run out of their hydrogen, okay, they become what's called a red giant. Okay, so they swell to this huge big size and get very bright. And in their core, they're not burning hydrogen anymore because you've just been left with all the helium that's been left over. But they are still burning it in this sort of tiny plasma shell around the core still. Energy can't really escape from that shell because it's a plasma. But what starts to happen is that because you've got all this plasma there, you start to turn photons, so light, into neutrinos. So you basically get this decay that happens photon into neutrino and antineutrino. And because they barely react with anything, they can escape and you get energy loss, okay? And that allows the star to stop the temperature and the pressure getting bigger and bigger until basically you ignite helium burning, okay? And when that happens, you dim again and, and you, you move away from being a red giant. So basically, ha producing all these neutrinos allows the star to stay brighter for longer and on this red giant branch.
If we think about what this might look like, this is a colour magnitude diagram. You might have seen this before in other Messier object videos. We like to draw these a lot. Draw like about a hundred times. Yeah, so this is your colour and this is your magnitude or your brightness. Here's the sort of main sequence where stars sort of live most of their life. You have very dim things up here and very blue things that are very bright up here, okay? And these are more massive as well. Then when things start to turn into red giants, they move off onto this sort of branch over here until they reach the brightest tip that they can before that helium burning kicks in and they move off it again. And that's rather exaggerated, but basically what they're looking for is how bright this red giant tip can get here. If this is the red giant branch, RGB, okay, then how bright is this tip? What this depends on is how much energy you can lose in neutrinos. But why can't you just do this with every star in the universe? So, because the Messier object M5 is this globular cluster, all the stars have been formed at the same time, and they all have the same age. So when you plot this colour magnitude diagram, you know how old the stars are because all of them have started to turn off onto the red giant branch of a certain age. So if these are the young ones I've got from here, and these have all turned off, and I've still got all my old stars down here, if I get an older population of stars, then this red giant branch will actually be down here because all of these have already died and only these ones are now on the red giant branch. And so what you end up with, if you get all the stars in the Milky Way, you just end up with this big smear of red giant branches, okay? And so this depends also on how many metals were in the gas that formed the stars in the first place as well. So, so many different variables. What you need is something that's all of the same age and same properties to be able to give you that very precise, like, tip of the, the red giant branch. So do you want to see the plot of their colour magnitude diagram that they made in nah. the paper? Yeah, yeah don't go on. <laughs> All right, so mine was a little bit exaggerated and theirs is a really old population as well. The red giant branch isn't as clear. So this is your magnitude again and this is your colour, okay? And on this side, here is your main sequence, okay? And then this is your red giant branch coming off and coming up here. And then this is where they've swept off to do helium burning and, and gotten a little bit cooler. This right here, this is your red giant branch tip, and this is the thing that they were trying to find and trying to get a really precise location for that. So it's the same thing as over there. And so once they'd found that, they then applied all their models of stellar theory to say, okay, well, how long has it taken them to get there and how much energy loss would you have to have from the neutrinos and therefore how are those neutrinos behaving in that magnetic field? And they derived a value for this dipole moment of 2.6 times 10 to the minus 12 of an electron's magnetic dipole moment. Well, I can sleep easy tonight. You can definitely sleep easy now, now that we all know that. <laughs> but the fact that you can get that number from a globular cluster in our Milky Way, you know, something that is 24,000 light years away, you can measure something of the tiniest particle known, is pretty cool. And it cost them nothing to build, like the Large Hadron Collider. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> they didn't need some massive particle accelerator to figure this out. They managed to do it with good old-fashioned astronomy. Can you tell me about this? I, I don't even know where to start. You just have to start talking because I'm okay. too excited. This specimen, um, we believe, came to the museum in 1910. It was a gift from the Royal Society of Tasmania, 